Valley. The message of that song is the things that we look for in this world, we need to be looking up to Him. We belong to the Lord. The things that He has for us, the eternal rewards that He has for us are the things that we should seek, not the things of this world. And it goes with our message today. As we continue this series through the book of Proverbs, uh, we're going to look today at the dangers of riches and the dangers of poverty. Now, that's something a little different than you, we would normally have on a Sunday morning. That's the key of doing uh, verses, uh, going through books of the Bible. And there's an area that here that, uh, uh, that we can't avoid, our possessions, those things that we have. Now, some here today, you consider yourself rich. Some of you consider yourself poor, and I would say the vast majority of us probably consider ourselves somewhere in between those. The Lord, though, sees all of us the same. As we look in Proverbs 22, 2, it says, The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Is it working for us? Yeah, good. The Lord is the maker of them all. God sees us all as one. His creations. He sees each of us also as a soul dealing with the same sin problem, right? Would we agree with that? Our abundance or our lack of resources doesn't change our sin problem. It doesn't matter who we are. It just changes the sins that we commit. If we go to Proverbs chapter 30, if you want to turn there, Proverbs chapter 30, the, the author of this chapter, he says, starting in verse 7, Two things have I required of thee, deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. The rich, in his overconfidence, he becomes self-righteous, confident in who he is or who they are, and we forget the Lord. While the poor, in their anguish, they are uh, so bitter that they, they steal and they lash out at God for their situation. So this author is saying, put me in the middle. Don't make me too rich. Don't make me too poor. So I will, I will seek after you. And no matter where you are today on that spectrum of wealth to poverty, King, hopefully we should say it, poverty to wealth, it would be a better way to say it, King Solomon has some wisdom for us to apply to help us not mess up our lives, as we've been looking at in this series. Now, let me say from the, the outset of this, the terms rich and poor, they're the relative, are they not? It really depends on where you are. Most of us could uh, take, move to a place somewhere like Belize and live like a king. With what we make, we could live like a king down here. Yet here in America, you might be living paycheck to paycheck or worse. The principles of God's word, though, apply to us no matter where we live and no matter what time we live in. So let's first look at the warnings and instructions to the poor. The warnings and instructions to the poor. Solomon is the wisest man that ever lived. There's no doubt. The Bible tells us that. If you look then at also the possessions that he had and probably adjust that for inflation, he was most likely the richest man that ever lived as well. And in his wisdom, he was able to discern the cause of people's poverty. And he gives some warnings. He gives some instructions and then the results of what happens when they are not followed. The first thing that we need to learn to do to not be in poverty is to have delayed gratification. Delayed gratification. Proverbs 22, 7 says, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. That one stings a little bit. The borrower is servant to the lender. Now, as you look at this, it doesn't forbid borrowing. It doesn't say borrowing is sinful. 
But Solomon does point out that the fact that once you become a borrower, we are then servant to that person, that bank, that institution who gave us the money, those that we owe. Anyone in here with a home loan knows, oh yeah, that's very true, right? The mortgage payments due every month. There's a reason that little card in your wallet is called MasterCard. It's true. The snowball effect of debt can keep us in bondage for decades. We know that. Some of us feel that right now. And it continues to grow and it grows. We have to ask ourselves the question, do I need debt for that small item, that trip, that gadget? Is it worth being indebted for years for that item. Now, there are larger items which they sort of require that kind of borrowing, don't they? A home, cars today. But even then, to what extent do I have to borrow? Do I need the largest possible thing I could possibly get and still be able to pay for? Am I overextending myself in that? And it boils down to delayed gratification. Delayed gratification means we save for it. We work for it. The gratification when we can finally afford that item, it is so much sweeter. It, it's there for and it doesn't come with strings attached to it. You know that thing that you buy and you don't have a payment for 15 months, but if you don't make that pay, pay it off by the end of that 15 months, all that interest that accrued during that time, now you owe it, Right? There's strings attached with that money. There isn't with delayed gratification when we save for it and when we work for that. When we live with the mindset of I have to have it now, we open ourselves up to destruction. And actually we can open ourselves up to shame as well. The Bible has a lot of verses about this. It says, Proverbs 10, 4, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. 28.19, he that tilleth his land, he that works in today's world, shall have plenty of bread, but he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. 28.22, he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Proverbs 13.23, much food is in the tillage of the poor, but there is that is destroyed for want of judgment. Two times we see here somebody that there was plenty of food there. The person was just, he refused to work. When we refuse to earn things properly, we refuse to work, we begin to scheme. Go on YouTube for five minutes and listen to the commercials. And if you happen to click on one of those commercials, you're going to see about a hundred more of them because now it's in your algorithm, right? And we see people begin to scheme an evil eye, as he calls it here. And we become prey to get-rich-quick schemes that are out there. All types of gambling become appealing to us. Everything from the lottery to sports betting on literally every sport known to man right now. Going so far as, as into options in the stock market, which is complete and complete gambling at that point. There's a reason why every poor community has a pony keg on the, on the corner of it selling lottery tickets because it is a glimmer of hope, yet it sinks, the, sinks, the, sinks that poor person deeper and deeper into debt. Don't buy the you deserve it today mentality that is being advertised everywhere. Eventually, that lifestyle will run out of runway. And when that plane finally lands, it will crash and it will end in bondage in your life. It's delayed gratification. Then he tells us also, we see here that we need self-control. Self-control of our desires and, and the wants, that's a biblical principle to have self-control. Lack of self-control in, in our appetites is also the prime cause of poverty. 20, 21, 17, he that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. 
He that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. 2321, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. We see a person that lacks self-control uh, to use their possessions. They, they lack that self-control to use their possessions with moderation in their life. There's nothing wrong with doing these things, but it's supposed to be done with moderation. Rather, you allow your appetites to control your actions. And your appetite uh, for food leads to gluttony. Your appetite for drink leads to drunkenness. Your appetite for pleasure leads to obscenity eventually. Your appetite for risk leads to gambling away your paycheck. Your appetite, you spend up what, they, what you have and you put yourself in a position of poverty that doesn't need to be there because of lack of self-control. This lack of control also when we see uh, the desire to have ease and to sleep and to sleep. The end of verse 23, 21 says, And drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. 20, 13, Love not sleep. Why? Lest thou come to poverty. We all know that person. You can't drag him out of bed. Constantly there. It leads to poverty. Just due to the number of hours in the day, it makes sense, Right? We need this. We need to follow the principles of God. Now, none of these promises, uh, no, none of these things promise great riches if you follow them. But the principles are God's principles. And they're given to us and they lead to supply the needs that we have in our life. Proverbs 13, 18 tells us for the person that doesn't want to listen, poverty and shame shall be to him that, what? Refuseth instruction, but he that guardeth reproof shall be honored. God's principles are there to be applied, right? These are all here in the book of Proverbs to be applied, but you and I have the choice, are we going to do that? Are we going to apply them? He tells us when we refuse his instruction, we will come to poverty and shame. It may not be the kind of poverty or, poverty or shame where you're living on the street or living out of your car, but it won't be the blessed life that God has for you. We can't do what we want all the time and then ask and expect God to bless our lives. It doesn't work that way. He is not a genie in a bottle. We need to follow his principles, live out the principles of self-control and delayed gratification. Each and every one of us make these decisions every day. Are you following God's principles in this area of life? There are items here in which the Holy Spirit will convict you. Will you follow his leading? For our teens and our young adults that are here today, I encourage you, set your patterns now. Because they're, they're so hard to break later in life. When you start the, the, I need it right now, I have to have it right now type mentality, that's impossible to break later in life. It's so difficult. Do that now. Set that pattern right now in your life. The goal here, please hear me, the goal isn't to get rich. The goal is to be obedient. Did you hear me? The goal isn't to get rich. The goal is to be obedient to the Lord. Obedience may not change your tax bracket. It may not. But it opens opportunities for God to bless you and for God to bless through you in your obedience to him and his word. So the warnings and instruction to the poor. Then we get to the warnings and instruction to the rich. Solomon actually gives a lot more instruction to the rich than he does to the poor. The first one is he, we see here is we need to show some humility in our life. Those that would be rich, and I would just say in America, we are the top of the world. Our poorest in this room today are still in the top of the world. Okay? 
So we really are in this, in this spot. And he tells us, as we look through his scripture here, we need to show some humility. Where the poor person often lacks self-control, the rich person doesn't lack in self-confidence and self-righteousness. Two times in Proverbs 10, 15, and 18, 11, we're told the rich man's wealth is his strong city. We're relying on our wealth. We're not relying on the Word of God. We're not relying on God Himself. We're relying on our possessions and the things that we've done and the things that we've created. On and on and on it goes. It ends that verse in 1811, and as high as a high wall in his own conceit. 2811, the rich man is wise in his own conceit. Proverbs 1128, the first part of that, he, trust, he that trusteth in riches shall fall. That's not a good place to be. This is America today. We say blaze a trail. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. May we gain some humility in our life and realize even if we did work our tails off and we gained it using our talents and our hard work, we have to realize that this was because of God's hand on our life. Yes, you worked hard, but he gave you the talent to do that. He gave you the health and the opportunity to do that. Anyone that's had a health scare at all knows from just how quickly in just a moment that can be taken from you and realizing that it is God that has allowed you to be in that spot in your life. Now, there are definitely self-made people, but let's have the humility to see that in the proper perspective of where we are and who we are. We need to have some humility. We also need to have some compassion and charity. One of the greatest driving engines of our economy has been capitalism. All right? You're going to hear a lot of that in the next few months, right? During this election cycle. Capitalism. However, if capitalism is not linked to godly principles of compassion and charity, it leads to greed, injustice, materialism. America 2024. God has given us great resources in our life. He has given us jobs. He has given us abilities. And if we do not use those properly and not have the compassion and charity that God instructs us to do, we have become no better than the world. And we have lost our witness to the world. The purpose of life is not to gather and gather and gather. In fact, God says in Proverbs 23, 4, labor not to be rich. That's not the goal. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom, he says. God has much more fulfilling purposes for you and I, and I'm glad. If all of my life was was the accumulation of things to where then I die and they go to whoever, what is that? That's not life. That's not, there's no purpose to that. God has a deeper, deeper purposes for us. And labor not to be rich, for our lives are more than this. Now, if you don't believe me, turn over another book. All right, turn over to, to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we have the same man, Solomon, now as an old man. And he has collected everything that any human being could possibly collect. More than anyone that's ever been on the earth. More than the richest person. More than Elon Musk today or, or whoever you can think of. More than that. And at the end of that, he boils everything down to what he, to, that he has collected to one word. What is that? Vanity. Vanity. All of this. Vanity. There has to be more purpose in life than just the collection of things. It's all Vanity. And he tells us, and he gives us some instructions now, uh, when he's wiser, younger, of things not to do and things to do. Those things that we're not to do, don't do these. And I'm going to let Scripture sort of speak for itself as we see verse after verse here. 22.16, he that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches and that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. 28.20, the last part of that, he that maketh haste to be rich, shall not be innocent. Trying to get rich really quick, you won't be innocent in that. 
Wealth gotten, verse 13, 11, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. 2021, 20, inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. We all know that person that wanted that inheritance as quick as they possibly could. They'll run over every brother and sister, aunt and uncle that they can to get that. At the end of that, it shall not be blessed. And you've seen that in their life as well. 1527, he that is greedy of gain troubleth his own soul. 288, he that useth usury, that's major interest on people, and unjust gain increaseth his substance. He shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. 1431 and 175, the same argument here. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth his maker. Who so, he, who so mocketh the poor reproacheth his maker. 2113, whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. 2222, rob not the poor because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate. Oppressing, mocking, robbing the poor. Intentionally not seeing the poor around us. Greedy in our gain from others and from our family in inheritance. Not one of these end with success. Did you see any of that? The person might have some money in the bank, but not one of those ended with success. In fact, those who try to do it quickly run into sin. It says they will not be innocent. There's no way to go outside of the boundaries of what God has set up and to do it quicker than we should. It's like that person that's out there lifting weights and they can't gain the muscle that they want to. So, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to inject some steroids there and help it. And there's some ramifications that come along with that. You will not be innocent. The same thing that we see here. The person that tries to go outside the bounds of what it takes to earn honestly the things that God would have us to do. He says, don't do these. But then he tells us some things to do. In 1917, he says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And that which he hath given, he will pay him again. 22.9, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. 28.27, He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack. The righteous considereth the cause of the poor. 29.14, The king that faithfully judgeth the poor, his throne shall be established forever. These are the things that God wants us to do with our money. These are the things that when we see them, this is what God would have us to do. Why? Why? Riches profit not in the day of wrath, he tells us 11.4. There's more than money. 22.1, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. What's going to linger after, after we pass away? That bank account? That 401k? That house, that possession, on and on and on and on it goes, or a good name that you've passed on to your child and your grandchildren and those around you in your church. 23 5, wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. 27 24, for riches are not forever. Solomon wants us to see the fleeting nature of our possessions and riches. He also puts the value on people versus things. Is that any surprise to us? That God puts value on us versus this around us? He moved heaven and earth just to bring his son here. He moved empire after empire to create roads, to create, to create the perfect situation for his son, his sinless son to be born, to see us, to get, make a way of escape for us, to be the salvation for us. It is no surprise that he puts more on people than on things. There is more to life, and the blessings from the Lord come. When we decide to follow the Lord and his principles, we gain the world, something the world cannot provide for us. Proverbs 10, the blessing of the Lord, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, 
and he addeth no sorrow with it. There's no strings attached. The blessings that God gives us, there's no shame that comes with it. There's no shame in how it was obtained in our life. You can put your head on your pillow at night and you can rest peacefully knowing that you're in the hand of God and that God has provided those things for you and you've done it honestly. There is an overarching principle. I'll share two more with you, Proverbs, and that we see running through all these verses and they, they come from both angles here. In Proverbs eleven twenty four and 13, 7, we see the first says, there is that scattereth, yet increaseth. There is that scattereth, yet increaseth. And there is that withholden more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Now the opposite side of that. There is that maketh himself rich, yet hath nothing. There is that maketh himself poor, yet hath great riches. Do you see what he's saying here? These verses are the same thought, and they contain more than one layer. The first layer we can look at would be sort of like a farmer's perspective of of the farmer out there spreading his seed. And the more seed he spreads over more of his land, the more crops he's going to gain in. Versus the farmer that decides, I'm just going to take a little portion of this and I'm just going to put out a little seed. What happens with that? There is less of the crop that comes in. The one that scattereth more gained more. The one that gets spread less, he gained less as well. The same aspect when it comes to business. The more you put into research and development, the more you're going to have discoveries and, and on and on it would go. The most important of this thought, though, is the investing in the lives of others. The spending of your life on those around you. Please stay with me. The scattering of your life. The scattering of even the resources that God has given you. We should invest our resources into the lives of those around us. God has put needs in front of you that he has not put in front of me. And he has put needs in front of you that are not in front of the people next to you. And God has placed you there for a reason, to help fulfill the needs that you have found. Yes, Proverbs 13, tells us a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children but not to the ignoring of the needs today. The needs in our lives today. Now, the greatest of all these needs is not due to the lack of our resources. The greatest need that we see is spiritual poverty. That's a rich that each of us have that know Jesus Christ is our Savior. The rich and the poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Remember we said that at the very beginning. When the life of a person is over here on earth, it doesn't matter what possessions they have in their bank account, what's behind their name at that point. The critical matter at that point is, do they have the possession of eternal life through Jesus Christ? That's the most critical possession that we can have. It's not, are are they spiritually poor? It's, are they spiritually dead at that point? More than just at death, though, we need to be concerned of those around us that are they, are they spiritually poor here on earth now while they're living their life? Are you a person that is scattering or are you keeping things to yourself? You're not sharing the gospel with those around you. You're not using your resources like you should. Scattering the actual seed of the word of God, the greatest wealth that is available to all, For the salvation in Jesus Christ. That means sometimes meeting felt needs of a person so that they can even hear the message that you're sharing. That means equipping those that go when you can't go yourself. Thinking of our missionaries. That means going yourself to places where people are desperately in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that means spreading our time spreading our resources to reach those that need to hear. Delayed gratification, self-control, humility, compassion, and charity. All of these become evident in our life as we walk closer to the Lord. And I'm glad. 
This isn't something I have to try to do on my own. This is something that is a natural fruit of what we, as we live and walk with the Lord. All of these help, though, to make our witness more effective towards our community. If you go and you start to tell somebody about Jesus Christ and they see your life as an utter shambles because you're not following the principles that God has placed, they're less apt to listen to you. doesn't mean they won't, but they're less apt to listen to you. If you have no humility, you have no compassion in your life, when we don't show delayed gratification, when we don't show self-control, why would someone want to listen to us? The principles that are in there to help us and to aid our witness. Now, for those of you that are here today and you aren't a Christian, I ask you, what is the goal in your life? Maybe it is the collection of, of things, maybe even for a good reason. Maybe to give those to your family. That's a noble. That's a noble cause. Each of us want to hand something to our children and our children's children. In fact, he tells us to. But is that it? Jesus saying to his disciples says, for what is a man profited if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Friends, it's not about the possessions. It's not about the riches of this world. Because then one day we'll come to a point where we'll give anything so that we can spend eternity with the Lord and not be in a place of eternal torment called hell. And I encourage you, turn to the Lord. Make your goal, make your uh, the key focus of your life to turn to the Lord, to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. The priorities need to change in our life. And the first is the humility to turn to the Lord and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Please do that today. We're going to come to a time of invitation. And when we do, there will be people here at the altar that will show you how you can accept Christ today. How you can bow your head and pray to the Lord and accept Jesus Christ. For those of us that are Christians here today, how are we applying these principles in our life? This isn't a subject we talk about very often, but it is throughout this entire book, and these principles are so very necessary in our life to live and be the witness that God would have us to be. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us, and as we look at your word, help us to be wise enough to apply these. Help us to have some humility to put aside our, uh, our pride that we would follow and that we would apply these in our life. There's some here today that might be in the situation of, of the poor. And maybe we're not to a state of devastation, but the, the, the path that we're leading is, is, is heading that way. And I ask you just to help us to modify, that we would change, that we would submit, that we would even repent of the things that maybe that we're doing that are outside of your will. Be with those that don't know Christ today. Draw them to you, dear Heavenly Father. They would first see their need for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.